Hi. This talk is State Machines Are Your Friend? Sadly, no My Little Pony references. I'm sorry. Hopefully, maybe there'll be some tonight. Who knows? There usually are. It's pretty good. I'm Matt. I'm an iOS and macOS developer. Um, I tend to travel around a bit and at the moment I am based up in Sydney working for a company called Fox Sports on their uh, footy is in AFL and league apps, which is kind of fun. So I'm going to begin with a story. Now, some of you here will know this story. This story is about business rules and banks. It is a story about the complexity that is often there and how I actually came up with, well, I, when I say came up as in, I decided upon an approach, the approach is not unique, but decided on an approach for how to solve the problem. So I'd been thinking through a whole sort of series of complex rules around what should happen when a particular transaction gets um, entered into a mobile app and sort of thinking, how do we start to understand the flow of this particular transaction and what it needs to do, what API calls it needs to make and stuff like that. So I was chatting about it with some of my work colleagues and then it sort of got to what is called the iOS huddle, which was just all of the iOS developers within that particular section of the bank getting together and chatting through it. And I ended up sort of starting to explain it, start, starting to talk about it, and I ended up going, why don't I use a state machine? And that was pretty much it. So like, how do you trick yourself into using something pretty good? You just talk through it, you explain it, and you go, yeah, this particular approach kind of makes sense. So that's the story, that's the background. As far as I know, it ended up fairly well. So this particular talk is about state machines and I will be covering what they are, I'll be covering why you should use it and I'll also be talking a bit about how they should be used. So first off, what are state machines? Who here thinks they have an idea about what a state machine is? Yeah, maybe four or five. Okay, that's pretty good. So, according to Wikipedia, and this is just a small snippet I've taken out from the Wikipedia page, and we all know how bad that can be as far as just taking something out of context. It is described as a mathematical model of computation. It is an abstract machine that can be in exactly one of a finite number of states at any given time. So when I say state machine, I'm really meaning finite state machine here. Uh, there is a difference, um, but we're dealing with finite state machines. So let's try and break it down a bit. What we saw from Wikipedia was a little bit complex, had a few terms in there that may or may not be understood. So the first of them is a model of computation. What this means is it is a, an idea or a way of sort of structuring and explaining how a particular computation is done. So typically for state machines, you will see them drawn as diagrams with arrows and round circles and stuff like that. We're actually not going to cover any of the diagrams. We're going to be dealing more with conceptual ideas and with code. It is to do with a finite number of states. That is, the list of all possible states is finite, as in it's restricted, it can be hundreds of thousands if you were insane enough to model something like that. But typically it is restricted to a small amount of different 
um, states, I'm using an overloaded term there. By state, I mean a particular way of representing what something is. So those are finite, they are limited. And the other thing is, only one of these can exist at a given time. So you can't have your model, your machine, measured as something that is a, um, sorry, as something that is existing in many states. It is something where the state is defined explicitly one at a time. Okay, why should we use a state machine? Now, as I hinted at before in the story, one particular really good and common use is to try and understand and define your business rules fairly well. But state machines are really good when you've got discrete states, so something that is fairly separated between each of those different states. So it's a good representation in that regard. Now, the transitions between your states can be predicated. What I mean by that is there are conditions which allow for transitions and define the actual what should happen and when. It's also a pretty good visualisation tool. So it's a way of drawing out at the start how your state, how your flow within the app is meant to work. That's pretty good. A simplification of business rules. So when you are presented with a list of requirements about what it is you need to accomplish, or your business rules, it's fairly easy to sort of overcomplicate their implementation. By using a state machine, you are able to define what those particular rules are, how they apply, and what the conditions between them are. It's also very good at communication of requirements. So when you're talking about the implementation with your teammates, you're talking about the requirements with your product owners, your business analysts, if you're talking about states and transitions, it's something everyone is able to understand. So for these reasons, state machines are a very good and powerful tool to be using. Now we get to the fun stuff, and this is how do we use state machines? Pretty cool. So first, a slight segue into what is the role of state within an app? Quite typically in I say typically in an app, but it's maybe not as common. You will have your view, which has a number of discrete states. There will be an empty state, there will be a loaded state, a load-in state, and an error state. All of these represent what can be displayed on your, on your screen, on your mobile device. So this is something that is fairly typical in an iOS application. Typical is in, I've seen it a lot, but that might just be my experience. It's a really good idea though, but we're not going to be specifically talking about view state here. We're going to be using the more general idea of state. So, first thing we need to do in building a state machine is define a protocol. This protocol is the state. What this does is it gives us a type that we can then use um, within the uh, machine, within the delegates, to actually make sure that we're passing the right thing around. So we define it as a state. We also want to define some things that happen as a result of the state changing and also what should happen what should be done for determining whether a state should change. So here we have a delegate. Um, 
because the delegate typically ends up being a view model or view controller, it's quite good to define it as class. Uh, that is restricting the implementation to being a class rather than a value type, which means you can have a weak reference to it. Here we're setting up an associated type, which is our state. And then we're defining our functions as a should transition, that is a function that works on the delegate that determines whether or not a transition from two states should exist. And then you have a did transition. So the did transition is there for determining, well, not determining, but reacting to a state that has transitions. So again, we have a from and a to, and the did transition gets called when the state has actually changed. Now, you can also introduce something like a will transition. So if you think to the view lifecycle where you have view will appear and view did appear, it's the same distinction where view um, will transition ends up being called before the value has changed and then did transition occurs after the value has changed. Sometimes this is a good distinction to make um, because you'll want to have things happen at different times. Then we get to the machine itself. So this is our um, state machine and it is generic over the delegate type. Because delegate has an associated type, we need to make state machine generic in this regard so that we can make use of the correct types. We initialize it with a value that is your initial state and that gets assigned to current state. Current state is private, um, just so we can sort of roll back a change if required. And then we are defining state as a variable. Now, the get is a re just returning the stored state and the set is what handles our should transition. So it calls um, should transition on the delegate and will transition from the from existing state to the new value. If it's allowed to do that, it then progresses. It will sort of save the current state as the old value, assign the new state, and then call the transition. Now, a lot of the time people think state machines needs to be a part of gameplay kit or something like that. Games make a lot of use out of state machines and they're probably a lot more powerful, but what we have here with the implementation, the delegate and the protocol is a very simple state machine that suits business rules. The good thing about this is it tends to be very isolated from everything else and becomes really, really testable. You can define things that conform to the delegate that don't need to be view controllers. They can be their own um, class and that way that class becomes unit testable. That's a really, really good thing to make sure that you're implementing the right business rules and the right transitions is by unit testing the class that conforms to your delegate. So, let's move on to some examples. These examples are pretty fun, but they're also somewhat contrived in that they're not taken from existing apps. For reasons of the presentation, we are just going to be using sort of an imagined idea. So, in these ideas, we've got an onboarding screen, we've got form entry, and we've also got some business rules. And we'll just walk through what a state machine would look like for these three examples. First one is an onboarding screen. So you might think, why does 
a state machine, why does this idea of finite state work with an onboarding screen? It works by an onboarding screen typically having about four or five different screens that it wants to show. And what is presented on those screens may or may not be dependent on actions taken on previous screens. So let's look at an example. Here we have the flow for an onboarding screen. It has an initial state which might be, hey, welcome to my app, you're awesome, let's get you started, stuff like that. Then you have a sign up section which may get some details from the user. You'd also, depending on the nature of the app, have push notifications and location services in there. So your should transition ends up looking something like this. It is just a switch statement taking in the, a tuple which is your from and your to. Now, this tuple might look a little bit strange to some people, but all it is is applying a label to the two arguments. This is beneficial in when you've got a longer list of possible transitions as it starts to become a bit muddled if you've just got two values there. By having the labels, it just provides a bit more clarity. It is a bit more verbose as well. So here, anything can jump to initial, push notifications to location, to location services, location to push, so you can sort of go back and forth, and you can also jump from push to sign up. It's pretty cool. Then, say, in your Onboarding flow, you could define some storyboard segues. Storyboards are amazing. I don't know why people don't use them more often. Maybe this thing called dependency injection, but that's a completely different thing. Um, yeah, storyboards are great. I thought I'll get that remark in there. But what you can do here is in response to a state transition happening, you can then transition to the particular view controller that you want, and you're just calling perform segue. These examples are fairly simplified, but it's all good. Next one is form entry. So he, who here likes setting up forms? Nope, no one exactly. They're very cumbersome, they're very complex, and there's a lot that can go wrong. So how does a state machine work for solving this problem? You define states to the state of the form. Your form can be empty. It can have an error condition. It can have some input. That input can be a string. It can be a long list of different values. It can be in a validated state. That is, you've made a check whether locally or against an API to say, yeah, everything looks good. And you can then submit it. So you've said to your API or whatever, here, save this data. OK, I've got a good response back. Everything is done. Cool. Looks like I snuck in something else again. Remote content. Uh, yeah, I think I just copy and pasted this into the wrong section, so I'm skipping it. Um, dum, 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 dum. Uh, yep, okay, sorry, um, copy and paste errors. Business rules. So as I said at the start, this talk is about business rules. It is about solving problems due to really, really complex requirements. Um, I could say that they were overly complex, but I don't define those rules. I just had to implement them. It gets really fun because there is a lot of complexity to your state machine. Ultimately, though, there's no difference. You're still dealing with a protocol, a delegate, and your state machine class. So, enum of business time. 
because everyone loves business. Here we have presented, we have some data entry, we have a validating state, we have a set fetching state, we have a simple rule, a complex rule, and everyone loves a good edge case thrown in there. So in this case, Tim will actually be able to eat the plant. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> That was from a uh, talk this morning um, where there was a joke made about how do you deal with edge cases. So I thought I'll make a joke as well. So as we've seen, there are some really good ways in which um, state machines can be used. They can be used for onboarding flows. They can be used for form validation and even your really complex business rules they become very simple by the definition of state and a finite state machine. Oh, and one more thing. Who remembers Logo Rider? Not many. So this may or may not make sense to people. Logo Rider was what I cut my teeth on and got a good understanding of programming from because it was about moving a turtle around on screen and drawing pictures and you did it all via a series of commands. So we could easily define this as a state machine and a series of transitions between states. So you have things like pen up, pen down, moving forward, um, uh, showing the turtle, hiding the turtle. They're really important things because if you're trying to do an animation using um, Logo Rider or Microworlds or Turtle, showing and hiding the turtle is pretty good. And then you have right turn, left turn, and there is a whole series of others. But yeah, all of this can be implemented as a state machine. Yay! State machines are awesome. So, thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you all about state machines and I hope you have learnt something. If you want to take a look at the slides, which is a markdown file, or even get a hold of a playground that it just has a simple state machine defined and some unit tests, Everything is available as part of this GitHub repo.